I have the honor of introducing Tom Haig, who's going to talk about ENIAC in a different way than generally it's talked about. So um, I don't want to make too much of a mess up introducing him, but really my quick read on the book is that it's about perspectives and people, uh, things that have always been there that maybe we haven't seen before about this machine. So I'm really looking forward to hearing from him. And um, I think that's enough to say without getting in trouble, right? Uh, evolution of ENIAC, construction. The piece that I liked a lot is to talk about construction, procurement, the techs, the women, the people that were behind the machine. Uh, but we'll let you talk. All right. Thanks, Jack. Um, just turn my mic back on. Is that coming through? Yes. Great. Uh, yeah, so the talk um, has got a different title from the book. Uh, the talk is Working on ENIAC, The Lost Labors of the Information Age. So the part of the book that I decided to pull out for the talk is about all the different kinds of work that go into a project like that and how that should change some of the stories that we like to tell about innovation. You know, what kind of work counts as innovation, who does it, etc. Now, the book itself, and I got some copies here, uh, bought a few down, I'll be able to sell them and sign them at the end if any of you are interested, um, covers a much broader range of perspectives. So it's got some, uh, it's got diagrams, it's got technical things. Um, it's in some ways, I think, kind of the most technically engaged um, history that's been published in the last couple of decades within, um, you know, by a university press on the history of computing. So, you know, if you're interested in assembly language programming or where the conditional branch came from, then, you know, we've got 10 pages of diagrams and so on on that. Now, that's not the side that I'm pulling out primarily on the talk. Um, one of the advantages of writing a whole book about just one computer was we were really able to take a number of different perspectives on it. Um, and I should also thank our sponsors for the project, Mrs. L.D. Rope's Second Charitable Trust and Third Charitable Trust. Um, and of course, thanks to my co-authors, Mark Priestley and Crispin Rope, and to assistance from several other people with the project. So, I mean, you probably kind of get used to people saying, right, why do you care about old computers? <laughs> and looking around here, I saying, oh, well, yeah, I mean, I guess they're kind of old, but, <laughs> you know, compared to uh, ENIAC, obviously, the computers that we've got here today are all a whole lot younger. So ENIAC um, goes back to World War II and the 1940s. Um, now, there's certain kinds of stories that we like to tell about genius and innovation, um, particularly around information technology. And I can illustrate those most readily by this film that, um, have, mo have most of you seen it, Imitation Game? It's about to show up streaming on Netflix, I think. So if you want to see it again, you can have that opportunity. And I got to admit, I thought it was terrible. <laughs> uh, <laughs> right, I mean, dramatically, like the poor history professor I dragged to see it with me, who didn't care anything about the history of computing and didn't care that everything was wrong, also thought it was terrible, just as like a piece of entertainment. It kind of fell flat. But there's one specific dimension of the terribleness that's going to concern us here, which is this kind of picture it gives of how technological innovation happens. So in the film, Alan Turing, who basically is being played by Sherlock Holmes <laughs> in exactly the same way. Um, you know, the autistic kind of humorless, genius, superhero shows up at Bletchley Park, which consists of five other people. And seeing the other brilliant mathematicians, um, crossword puzzle solvers, chess players assembled to crack the codes says, Immediately, I don't have any time to explain myself as I go along, and I'm afraid these men will only slow me down, right? Because he's a genius. And then you get some montages, and it shows that he thinks of building this machine that they kind of imply is a computer, even though it isn't. Um, then he draws up some blueprints, all on his own. And then he goes off in a corner for a year or two and builds the thing with his bare hands. And everybody else says, wow, what's Turing doing with that weird thing? Ah, that'll never work, right? So in the story, there's this machine that basically wins World War II. And one guy thinks of it and builds it personally. Um, now, 
In reality, of course, there were something like 10,000 people working at Bletchley Park um, by the end of the war. There were not just one machine built, there were a couple of hundred of these bombs manufactured on the British side and a bunch more in the US. They required hundreds of operators, etc. But for some reason, the, version of, the only version of the story that kind of seemed to be saleable and would fit in with the stories that people like to hear about innovation is one lone genius goes in a corner, builds a machine by himself. Now, Jack mentioned there's a procurement side of the story, and having looked at the ENIAC procurement, it was really interesting that these machines weren't even built at Bletchley Park. They were subcontracted to a company that built tabulating machines. So, I mean, maybe they thought a drama about procurement contracts and, you know, quality control and manufacturing wouldn't really, like, appeal to anybody. But, you know, if you care about how the history actually happened, then the difference between one computer built by one guy in a corner and 200 machines contracted out to a factory plus 10,000 people working at Bletchley Park, it's a very different kind of story. And in the case of ENIAP, I've tried to tell that other kind of story that you know, looks at all the stuff that goes into it across its entire lifespan. Now, another place you may have come across ENIAC fairly recently is Walter Isaacson's The Innovators. And, I mean, to be fair to it, it has many admirable features. So at least, Walter Isaacson at least tries to tell a story that's about teamwork, right? Um, so he says, yeah, it's not just one person invented the whole computer, you've got to look at like all these different things, and they add up to modern computer technology. And he did read a bunch of stuff, he's got a load of footnotes, he cites things, and at least, you know, because as we know from the jobs bio, it's a kind of California-centric Silicon Valley view of things, but he doesn't just start in the 70s, he goes back to Babbage and Lovelace and so on. And he has spoken about the role of liberal arts in tech education, so those are all kind of good things that I agree with him about, but I've also got some fairly fundamental disagreements with the way he sees the history of innovation. And you don't have to go very far for those, you can start with the title. Right. How a group of hackers, geniuses, and geeks created the digital revolution. So this is a view of history that everything, you know, and I, uh, you, you'll come across this in many other places too. It's not that Isaacson invented this. He's just kind of reflecting this popular understanding. Everything is down to some hackers, geniuses, and geeks, you know, who create the digital revolution. Um, now, if you look in Amazon computer history, and I took this snapshot a few months ago, but it's still basically the same story, it's hard to overemphasize like, how much this particular view of history is dominating how ordinary people hear about the history of computing. Right? So in the top 10, there are one, two, three, four versions of Isaacson's job biography, and three versions of his other book, The Innovators. Right, so I, I like to joke that the Braille version of um, Innovators is probably outselling ENIAC in action. Um, but when I was kind of writing about this, I also write this history of computing column for communications of the ACM. And one of the things I was trying to think about, like how to convey this, I thought, well, it's true that he talks about teamwork, but it's still basically a team full of superheroes. Like all the people involved are genius, brilliant, geek, innovator guys, but they have to work together across history to get the job done. And I thought, well, where else have we seen a team of superheroes? So, you know, it's basically the Avengers, right? They're all still superheroes rather than ordinary people, but they still have to work together to save the world, or in this case, invent the digital revolution. So I wrote this up. If you kind of Google this, it's online. I wrote up this side of the argument in this column called Innovators Assemble, Ada Lovelace, Walter Isaacson, and the Superheroines of Computing. Um, so if you want to know what I really think about Ada Lovelace, you can find it there. Now, the history of this early period of computing in the 40s has tended to be dominated by this battle for firsts, right? And this is just kind of a fairly random sampling. So, oh, um, this book about ENIAC, the world's first computer, Alan Turing, is also the father of the computer. So is Atanasov. Uh, in these two books, so is Konrad Zuse, if you ask Germans. And um, so the only thing 
And you know, it continues to this day, right? Like any time an online publication runs some story about an early computer, the only thing that is going to show up in the comment sections is 20 people with way too much time on their hands who are only going to care about this question. Did the story get the right answer to what was the first computer? And it doesn't really matter what the story is actually saying, but they'll just be, oh, early computer. Hey, you guys, it was Atanasov. What are you talking about? And they'll kind of argue with each other for a while until the comments thread closes down. So this is kind of still a question that, you know, apparently there are, there are people out there really care about. It's not so much the question that I care about personally. Um, ENIAC, though, has been seen kind of as one of these like great machines that is a contender for the title of the first computer. So just to kind of give you the time, general time period on this, because you know, I know most people don't walk around with these facts in their heads. So ENIAC starts in World War II, proposed and approved in '43. Uh, basic kind of architectural work done, detailed plans and prototyping work in 44. Most of the construction uh, happens in 45. They put the thing together, they start debugging it. First use at the end of 45. A year of somewhat experimental use at the Moore School at the University of Pennsylvania, which is where the thing is built in 46. Then in 47, they are reassembling and testing it, getting it back into use at the Ballistics Research Lab, which is the government institution that paid for the thing and owned it. Then it has, it really gets back into gear in 48. So 48 to 54 is when it's doing the work. And by 55, it's kind of already obsolete and they decommission it. So that's the overall span of the life uh, as, as we see it. Now, here also is kind of an example of the position that ENIAC has conventionally been given in the history of computing. Now, I know these are all kind of very small, so ENIAC, though, is hard to miss, right? It's the base of the tree. So everything else, now, they made this in the 60s. So they basically took every other computer they knew about and tied it back to ENIAC. Now, this diagram you may have seen before if you read in the history of computing. It's been fairly widely reproduced. What <laughs> is what they don't always tell you is it was drawn up by the Ballistics Research Laboratory. So they had <laughs> a certain view of uh, history that's reflected in the tree. But this has pretty much been the conventional idea, right? ENIAC is the, is, this is sort of an upside, um, in a way it's an upside down root. But if you think of the trees being this way up, it's kind of the base of the trunk and then everything else is splitting out. Um, Here's another view. This is from a classic uh, 80s paper in the history of computing by Arthur and Alice Burks. So they tried to sort of figure out how ENIAC relates to other computers that were before and after. Um, their answer to that is that a whole bunch of technologies like electronics, IBM plug boards are flowing into ENIAC. But then ENIAC gives rise to a design for a later computer called EDVAC, right? If you ever read about the history of computing, you'll hear about EDVAC, first draft of a report on the EDVAC von Neumann architecture. That's the first statement of the architectural principles that pretty much all subsequent computers are based on. So ENIAC gathers together some of this stuff, but then you need these extra innovations, a, a large writable electronic memory plus the von Neumann architecture, and that is what feeds forward into the later computers. So in a way, see, the, the professional historians of computing, when the first people to care about the history of computing were mostly the old guys who invented computers, because you know, they wanted to know like, who got the prize for the first computer, and their families, and you know, their colleagues, and people who were from Iowa or Germany and you know, felt local pride. Um, and that was in the 70s. Then as people with PhDs in, in history started to get involved in computing more into the uh, 80s and 90s, they kind of didn't want all the time engaging this argument. So they basically came up with adjectives to insert between first and computer so that everybody got sent home with a prize and <laughs> <laughs> we could find something more interesting to talk about. So the adjectives that ENIAC got were electronic digital general purpose computer. And you know, Atanasov got some adjectives too, and Zeus got some adjectives, and you know, everyone could be happy. Um, but when it's conceived in these contexts, as you see from this diagram, it's generally been thought of as something that's not so much of interest in itself, but of interest because of what it led to, because it gathered together some of the technologies that get combined with these other ideas to make 
the von Neumann architecture of stored program, modern computer. Right? In that sense, its place in the story reminds me of this guy. Anyone recognize him? John yeah, right? He's got an important place in the story, but we really care about him because of what he's heralding, not you know, in his own right. So in summary, conventional history of this computing period has been, uh, uh, the 40s, has been obsessed with firsts. It tended to reduce each computer to a single date of first operation. So remember that timeline I gave you? ENIAC doesn't even like get installed for the people who've paid for it and start doing useful things for them until 1948. But nobody is really interested in ENIAC after 1945 because it's conceived of in these terms, basically, as this thing that sits between these earlier technologies and this other stuff, right? So the dates that Burks gave to ENIAC is 43, 46. He basically lost interest in it when it started working. Now, <laughs> right, you think of it as this point you pass through to get to somewhere else, not as like something that's interesting in its own right. And in this book, we're very much interested. I mean, we do have, I say modestly, the kind of best thought through, most carefully grounded story of this whole first draft John von Neumann invention of what's often called the stored program computer that's ever been done. But we're also interested in ENIAC for much more than that. So a whole chunk of the book is about what ENIAC is actually used to do, how it's operated, and so on. OK, now to go through some of this, so building it, I gave you the kind of chronological outline briefly. I'm going to flesh that out in a little bit more detail. So it's built by the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia, specifically by the Moore School of Electrical Engineering. So at that point, this had been in business for a bit more than 20 years. Now, you don't necessarily think of it this way anymore, uh, but Philadelphia used to be this, and, and New Jersey used to be the center of the electronics industry, uh, both because you have Bell Labs right there, but you have firms making vacuum tubes, and you also have the biggest consumers of vacuum tubes at this point in the radio industry. So that's all kind of clustered between Philadelphia and New York in that general area. So as the um, electrical engineering school at the University of Pennsylvania, electronics is a big thing, in term, and they have strong ties with local industry. They'd previously partnered with the Ballistics Research Laboratory to build this thing, a differential analyzer, a mechanical analog computer. And I saw out there somewhere there's an analog computer, so uh, it's kind of good to see that people haven't completely forgotten about those. Uh, but it was, you know, it was a relatively small school. It was, it was a good school, but it was nothing like the scale of MIT as a center for engineering. Uh, the project initiators, the two guys who typically get their name associated with ENIAC, were John W. Morkley and J. Presper Eckert. Morkley had graduated with a PhD in physics in the Great Depression, which was not a great time to graduate with a PhD. Uh, he'd found a kind of teaching job, but he wasn't having a kind of high-powered research career. He retrained in electronics, taking advantage of a special course that was organized to train people for the war effort, then got a job on the faculty at the Moore School. Eckert was the Moore School star engineering student. Um, he'd recently graduated and been recruited to the laboratory staff for the war projects. So, they had a number of previous war projects, and this was kind of scaling up the number of people working at the school significantly. They finished up building an extra floor to accommodate sponsored projects after the war. So um, they, uh, they had other radar-related projects there as well. Now, the ordnance department, the guys who were paying for it, Ballistics Research Laboratory, they wanted to make these things, firing tables. So. As you would imagine, there was a lot of shooting happening in World War II. Now, if, like me, you don't know much about guns, you tend to think about the kind that you basically point and like, look down, and then you pull the trigger. But most of the casualties in World War II were actually caused, uh, caused by shells, mortars, those kinds of things. And in those cases, I mean, you line it up, and that tells you the direction it's going to go in. But you also have to set an angle on it, and that tells you how far it's going to go. And with the bigger guns, you're shooting at something that you can't even see. So now you do kind of fire one off, and then hopefully someone tells you if it landed close to where it was supposed to go, and then you adjust it. But the problem is then people take cover. So it made a huge difference to the effectiveness of the war if they were able to land on target with the first shell instead of kind of firing off a bunch and homing in on the thing that they're trying to hit. And the challenge is basically like angry birds, right? <laughs> You know, you've got that little catapulty thing. You know how far you want it to go. The question is the angle. So the table is going to tell you the angle, 
using a specific kind of munition in a specific gun, um, adjusting for elevation and weather conditions and temperature and various other things. And it required a lot of computation. Um, right? Now, if you ever kind of do basic calculus, then you learn how to solve things analytically by substituting some terms and so on. But the problem is most real equations in the world you can't solve that way. Uh, they only give you the ones that work that way <laughs> on purpose. So to solve most of the equations that you actually have to solve in you know, engineering and practice, you need to do numerical approximation. So what that basically means is they need to figure out um, what makes this particular equation hard to solve is that there's drag in it. Right? If they were firing shells on the moon, they'd be fine, but on Earth, not so much. So they have to use the numerical approximation. And that means they have to do each one of these rows in the table that says how far the shell goes, they have to basically plot out the entire, entire trajectory, making many calculations per second to see, all right, it moves a little bit, it slows down this much, it moves a little bit, it slows down this much, and you get a good approximation to how it actually moves. Which meant that calculating these tables took an enormous amount of human labor, which meant that they were shipping the guns to Europe without the tables to go with them. So the army thought this was a problem, and they were prepared to pay a bunch of money for something that promised to get them the tables in time. Now, in a way, they were conned because <laughs> by the time the machine was ready, the war was over. But, you know, you've got to, like, take your sponsorship where you can get it. All right. Um, now, who else kind of worked on it? If you look fairly closely in published histories, you can also find the names of the engineering team. So most of these were design engineers. They worked under Eckert and Morkley and uh, designed different parts of the machine uh, and oversaw production. But there's other kinds of long-time roles that we don't tend to think of in terms of the innovative uh, process, right? Who's really doing innovation? Um, on the higher end, the school's dean and a guy that you've probably never heard of, John Grist Brainerd, was the official director of the project. And because they weren't doing the technical design themselves, people tend to say, ah, those guys didn't really do anything. But when we look at the archival records and so on, we see, oh, actually, wait, they were kind of doing things. They were just doing that kind of bureaucratic, administrative, um, getting things done stuff that we you know, don't, <laughs> don't tend to kind of view as seriously in terms of innovation. On the other hand, you probably have never heard of Isabel Jay, the project secretary, although uh, she was one of the few people who were full-time on the project right from the beginning, or people like Marjorie San Santa Maria, who drew up the engineering blueprints, and we kind of see her name on them in the archives. You know, that's clearly an a kind of innovative work that's necessary that doesn't get remembered at all. Because no one's really cared about ENIAC actually doing anything, they also haven't tended to care so much about things like Hans Rademacher, who was a numerical ex uh, methods expert, and he knew how those firing table calculations would work mathematically and was able to tell them how many digits they needed to store, and they changed the design as a result. Um, and on the BRL side, Herman Goldstein, he's reasonably well known in the existing histories, but we kind of find some new material about his role, basically was supposed to be overseeing the contract but finished up going native and very much identifying with the team that was building ENIAC more than you know, the interests of BRL itself. His boss, uh, Paul Gillen, Leyland Cunningham at BRL, who was head of a group trying to figure out what they'd do with ENIAC when it arrived, um, and Derek Lehmer and Haskell Curry, who were mathematicians and would-be users, who also were kind of involved in working out how the machine was going to be used. Now, as I already mentioned, it was structured from mathematical analysis. So there's this kind of view of history. It's one of the most misleading things in the Walter Isaacson kind of view of history, but it's been widely repeated based on some kind of oral histories conducted much later. And it doesn't stack up at all with the archival evidence. But the story people tell is they kind of built ENIAC and finished it and got it ready. And then the day before the demonstration, they had to think, oh, wait, how is this thing going to do firing tables? And some women stayed up late and figured it out. Now, as you might expect, when you're paying all that money for a machine that's only intended to do one job, that's not how it really happened. So right from the beginning, they were very much involved in thinking through how can we have a machine that's going to do these calculations. Now, it turned out it could do an awful lot of other stuff as well, but clearly they put some thought into how it's going to do the thing that the single job it was being justified to do. So 
though mathematical analysis we found when he looked in the archives was contributing to it. And this, the first attempt by anyone to document how ENIAC could be set up to do something, was very early in the project, in the fall of 1943, and fundamentally guided the decisions made. This was done by Arthur Burks. So that's a nice kind of hand-drawn thing we found in the archives. Right, so what they finish up with is this completely unique architecture. Uh, there's never been a machine like it before or since. So wires are routing control pulses from one unit to another, but there are specialized units. So there's 20 accumulators. They add and store. There's a multiplier, a divider square router unit, three function tables that can hold uh, basically a read-only addressable memory. Um, three, yeah, three panels of multiplier, a panel that um, buffers and drives the card punch for the output and so on. But to tackle a specific problem, I think of it as being almost like one of those um, Radio Shack like 201 electronic kits. You've got a bunch of components there and you've got terminals and you can build an awful load of different circuits with it. So you set up wires to build you know, the burglar alarm or the flashing light or whatever the particular project is. So ENIAC in a way was basically a construction kit you could build a special purpose computer from to do whatever job was you actually wanted to do. And you built two ad hoc kind of networks with it. Um, one for the control pulses that would say, once we finished adding, what do we do next? Oh, and literally you kind of run a wire from an output terminal in the adder that's just finished its job to an input terminal to fire up whatever is supposed to do something next. There's a separate network for data pulses. So you need to make sure that a, by the time one unit emits a data pulse, another unit is now ready to receive them. Um, you want to know more about ENIAC programming, it's all in the book. I'm not going to say a whole lot beyond that. Um, so some technical specifications, right? It was supposed to cost $150,000, finished up costing $500,000 plus another $90,000 or so for delivery and setup. Uh, filled about 2,000 square feet, weighed about 30 tons, used up about 150 kilowatts of energy. Now, the funny thing, I gave this talk to a bunch of data center guys, and they said, oh, you know what? That's still our building block. We like go, go in chunks of 150 kilowatts. So it's comparable with kind of a respectable modern data center installation, but it only had 200 decimal digits of uh, writable memory, so not quite as powerful. Uh, 4,000 digits of memory on the switchboards that you could change, and it could do about 30 multiplications a second. You, you typically see additions quoted, but it turns out for the kinds of applications that were complicated enough you needed to use a computer, what you really cared about was multiplication speed. Now, you want to get a sense of what that memory looked like. Uh, and I kind of held one of these. So this picture gets tweeted out by a robot all the time on, on, <laughs> on Twitter. You, you may have kind of seen it. And it's misidentified as ENIAC women. But in fact, it's a picture from about 1962 at BRL. And one of the things we talk about in the book, we've got a chapter on how ENIAC has been remembered after it went out of service. Um, it was originally a super powerful giant brain. A, by the time it was shut down, it was remembered mostly for being slow and heavy and <laughs> not very powerful because it was used as this kind of measuring stick to make every other computer look like really great value and fast and so on. So she is holding one digit, one decimal digit of ENIAC storage. The lady next to her has got it, I think, from um, one of the next generation machines. So it's four generations of one of computers at BRL showing how much smaller, see, and by that point, you could fit an entire decimal digit <laughs> worth of storage on something only that big. Uh, right. Now, in terms of the procurement challenges, um, if you read in the history of computing, they tend to describe ENIAC as being challenging because it involved making thousands of vacuum tubes work together for long enough to do a job. And it was, and that was an unusual thing. But people get so hung up on the vacuum tubes, they forget about all the other pieces that went into the computer. And in a wartime economy with so many different projects underway, getting all those pieces procured was a real challenge. 
the government actually basically went for some kind of Soviet style central control system of, of all those items. And everyone got, every project got issued a certificate that said how important it was, and that would decide like, whether it got its materials or not. Um, so one of the things we found in the archives was um, material related to procurement. What we were surprised though, um, even wire, right? Now you'd think like at least wire, it shouldn't be too challenging, but you know, they had miles of the stuff in the machine. It needed to have properties that worked well for digital electronics, which was not at all a common application in those days. So at the beginning of the project, actually went up to MIT, found some wire built into something that looked like it would do the job, but no one at MIT could remember where it had come from. So they took home a stretch of the wire, cut it into small pieces, and stapled it to letters that they sent to suppliers saying, is this your wire? And if not, could you make us some like it? Until they found someone that would be able to supply the right kind of wire. Um, Precision resistors, some of the resistors, because of the digital application, seem to have very specific characteristics that were not at all common in those days. And they really hit a brick wall trying to convince the war production rationing people assigned to the project that, that those resistors were really different from the other kind that they were prepared to supply them with. Fortunately, the Dean Harold Pender turned out to be the founder of the company that made the resistors. So at that point, the paper trail stops, but someone later said in oral history they basically just did an end run around the official system and got the resistors directly. Um, the power supplies, late in the project, when it was already very late, it almost got pushed back by another six months because they placed the order for the power supplies with a fly-by-night company run by a white supremacist who had, had got rich scooping up the rights to the Thompson submachine gun after it was banned for civilian use. And those turned out to be a fortune when the war, worth a fortune when the war came along. He was looking to diversify and went into electronics. And they were just completely unable to deliver the material that they promised that they could build way quicker than GE could. <laughs> so that almost killed the whole project. Uh, but fortunately, the company that was hired to make the backup transformers delivered them quicker than expected. And everything else was delayed so much that it finished up not making that much difference. Um, now, all these, no one ever really talks about who actually built ENIAC. Um, but all those materials didn't just, you know, magically assemble themselves once they were delivered. So what we found was, fairly quickly, this became by far the biggest thing that was happening in the Moore School. And they basically were running like a medium-sized, you know, industrial production business out of the place. So by the end of 1944, as they were gearing up to produce most of the units, yeah, they got those seven people you've already heard of, the design engineers, engineering and testing, the mechanical design and drafting, they had a model making team, and they came up with some kind of bureaucratic rules for, yeah, this has to be signed off on and certified by, um, and then you have to make a model of it and, before we send it to production and so on. But the surprising thing, 34 full-time equivalent production workers already by the end of 1944, right? And we were like, oh, well, we never really hear about those people. Uh, but when I cross-referenced with the accounting and personnel records, because I'm also trained in business history, so I think to you know, do that kind of thing, uh, what we found was that there were people we never heard of showing up uh, with job titles like wiremen, technicians, and assemblers. And those are the ones who actually built the thing. Now, the other interesting thing we found, sometimes they listed full names for some of them, and we were able to say, oh, wait, look. Um, Eleanor, Simeon, Caroline, Dorothy, Jane, Pepper, like, I never heard of those people, right? Because there's some famous women of ENIAC. I'm going to mention those later. Um, but these are not the famous women of ENIAC. These are the women who actually built ENIAC, and it turned out no one had ever heard of them. So you tend to say, oh, you know, you evil historians, you're reducing women to a footnote to history. Um, and in this case, that was actually a big upgrade. So the only thing we could basically find out about them were the names. And they're in a footnote. But <laughs> we found there's at least 50 women. And there's other ones we've only got initials for. Could have been men or women. We'll never know. Uh, but there's at least 50 confirmed women working on ENIAC in 1944 alone before those six famous women of ENIAC had any involvement with the project. All right, and there's a kind of close-up on some of the names. 
Now, I mentioned Goldstein had kind of gone native because he was um, not so much looking for, to provide oversight to the project as looking for ways to justify that it continued. And um, I don't know if any of you have ever kind of been involved in projects. What they tend to do is be late and over budget. And you have to kind of figure out ways to explain why, despite this, they shouldn't be stopped. Now, this was a particular problem as the end of the war loomed because they weren't, you know, the need for those firing tables was going to become a lot less urgent. And in fact, every wartime contractor got a clause written in that it could be canceled without penalty if it was no longer needed because the war had stopped. So, you know, they can kind of read the news. They know, like, how things are going. And so in May 26, 1944, it's going to be finished by October 1st. In August 1944, it's going to be virtually complete by the end of 1944. In September 1944, things are still going great, and they're onto the fairways. In December 1944, they're in the throes of completing it within the next two months. And somehow in May 1945, they're still on the home stretch, and they hope to start testing soon. Um, so in fact, thing is finally kind of finished enough to test it as a whole, right? So they go from unit testing to system testing in November of 1945, by which point, as you know, the war is already over. And fortunately, the military stay on board, and they have a big launch party, 15th February 1946. It's also on the front page of the New York Times that morning. Uh, they were actually smart. Goldstein did a number of smart things, and one of them was to have a press preview of the launch two weeks earlier under embargo. So they brought in the journalists, showed them the machine, got them excited, gave them time to write their stories. And then by the time it's launched on the evening of February 15th, it's already been on the front page of the New York Times that morning. Right? Now, getting on the front page of the New York Times isn't that easy, and it remains one of the reasons that ENIAC is so famous to this day. It becomes like the computer, kind of thanks to this great launch event. So that's another kind of work that maybe kind of gets undervalued in the conventional histories. Um, they wanted um, the uh, representative from the military. Um, I think they wanted Eisenhower, but you know had to kind of work down the ranks a little bit. Um, so they got uh, the head of the Ordnance Department Research and Development Service the president of the National Academy of Science, the president of the University of Pennsylvania. They took kind of the fanciest uh, huge, um, dining hall that was, could seat that many people. And uh, they had lobster and steak and fancy cakes. Um, so they kind of really pulled out the stops in terms of uh, having a party for the thing. And as I mentioned, <laughs> electronic computer flashes answers may speed engineering. All right. Now, once they were getting to the point that the machine was going to be ready for testing, they had to think about who was going to operate the thing. So at this point, the operators who you may well have heard of, um, six women were selected who'd previously been computing the trajectories manually. Because they said, well, it, they already know how to do the computation manually. That's going to be a big step because they'll understand what the computer's actually doing. Um, the six women operated ENIAC through its year of use in 46 at the Moore School. Some of the idea was that they would be trained there and they'd go on to Aberdeen, though not all of them went back to um, BRL in Aberdeen, Maryland. And the ones that did, um, most of them had left by the time it re-entered operation. Um, so their duties, they had a really wide range of duties. So one of the things they were doing was just, you know, hands-on working ENIAC, right? Because it needed like constant, you know, taking cards in and out, kind of checking it, you know, pushing the switch to start it and stop it. Very hands-on. But they were also involved in helping to diagnose and correct problems because the operators, you know, are the people who know how the machine works and what it's doing um, in terms of helping to set up the configurations for the machine. I'll talk more about that in a second. And, and working the auxiliary punch card equipment that went with it, and I'll show you what that meant in a second. So they had a kind of expertise that was very valuable as well in helping visiting scientists and engineers who had some equations they needed to solve, figure out how to turn that into a setup that would let ENIAC do its job and get them their answers. Right. So you can see it in action there. It had, if, uh, that's basically like a very old TV wired remote control unit. 
So you can sit down and start and stop it with that little box there that he's holding in his hand. Uh, and it's also got a single step debugging mode. Uh, ENIAC invented that, I think. And it also invented the breakpoint, which was quite literally just removed one of those control wires and then you break the circuit. I think that's probably where the term comes from and it doesn't go on to the next step. Um, so when it was working, it was actually a pretty easy thing to debug in its own way. Um, and you can see the wires and cables there that are wiring those ad hoc data and control buses between the different units. Now, what you don't see on that picture, but it is actually incredibly important, ENIAC also could only be used along with a bunch of existing conventional punch card machinery. So punch card machines have been in use since uh, the 1890s. Uh, by the 30s, a lot of companies were doing things like payroll, uh, check generation, kind of routine data processing with them. So they could store letters as well as numbers. Uh, but you had a bunch of different specialized machines. So you had a sorter, a collator, a punch, a tabulator, a verifier, a duplicator. And each machine basically just tackled one operation. So to have an algorithm that actually gets the job done, there are also human steps involved in, okay, we sort them this way, then we sort them this way, then we take one of the decks we sorted and we collate it this way, then we run it through the tabulator with these settings. So it does some of what we think of as a computer doing, but the steps, the structure would come from the human operators moving the cards between machines. And in many ways, ENIAC continued to work the same way. So this is the flow, uh, this is a diagram that we prepared based on one of the most important jobs tackled on ENIAC. In a way, it's the first modern computer program. Uh, but what we saw was it did a bunch of steps internally with its kind of coded logic. But then it still had a bunch of steps that needed to be done manually by the women running punch card machines, sorting the decks, like, et cetera, and then feeding them back into the input for another run through. So it wasn't just that you pushed a button and it whirred and worked for a long time and did its job. There was still an awful lot of human labor and steps with punch card machines bound up with getting the machine to do anything. And we see them here working with the punch cards. Now, this is maybe the most complicated job ever run on ENIAC. Um, John von Neumann's team at the Institute for Advanced Studies were building a much powerful newer computer, which was years late. And um, they'd also hired a bunch of people to figure out how to do numerical weather calculations. This was the first time that was ever done. And they got tired of just sitting there waiting for the computer to be ready. So they figured out a way to get the job down into ENIAC sized pieces. And that involved an amazing amount of punch card operations. So we see here with this column is the ENIAC operations. But between each one of those is a bunch of punch card output and manual punch card operations to change the output from one step into a form that's ready to be the input for the next step. Now, ENIAC was also a material space. In fact, the talk's called working on ENIAC, but there are, the people literally were working in ENIAC, right? Um, the panels basically, you could probably set them up in a room that was like twice this size. And what they would do is go between the real wall and the interior. So ENIAC was basically a set of room dividers and you'd go around the back when you needed to work on the tubes and you'd stand inside it when you wanted to work the machine. Um, at the Moore School, um, it wasn't an ideal kind of physical environment. So in a way, what they were also doing was inventing the data center, right? Inventing a physical space that can hold a computer. That space was not the Moore School. So Christmas Day, Morkley went home at 3 a.m leaving five men still working, mopping up water and emptying buckets which catch drips after the snow melted and the building didn't keep the water out very well. Prior to that, there'd been a fire when the machine was left turned on overnight, um, which is good for the vacuum tubes, uh, but unfortunately they caught fire. And uh, luckily the engineers, and, and it had blowers, so they didn't have air conditioning at the Moore School, but they had blowers built into each thing to cool it down. Fortunately, they thought to engineer a cutoff circuit into the blower, so when the temperature spiked from the fire, it cut off instead of blowing the fire through the rest of the computer. And they only lost one panel and were able to get it fixed. 
Um, the move to Aberdeen, right, which is not that far. Google Maps here is saying what an hour and 18 minutes now. They didn't have the freeway then, so you know it would take longer. Um, I, had, by the way, I had this kind of glamorous idea of you know World War II trucks pulling up outside and camouflage soldiers jumping out, but it turned out they subcontracted most things with civilian people. Um, the air conditioning, you know, the, vac the um, ele electricity provision, etc. They also subcontracted the moving. So they got different quotes. They selected a local moving company. The guys turned up. They knocked a hole in the side of the wall <laughs> because they couldn't get it through the door. Uh, they winched it out into a truck. And uh, sometime later, it showed up in Maryland. This is, uh, we've got the bills of lading and so on in the archives. Um, they also had to kind of hire people um, to figure out how to install the equipment. This is what the back of the computer looked like. You don't usually see that. Um, HVAC plans, right? Subcontractors, engineer, um, specialists for that. Um, the test room, electric service plan, right? Needed that 150 kilowatts. Turned out, by the way, getting the good electricity was a real challenge. They finished up installing a flywheel between the electrical input and the machine. Um, so it was basically running off a generator that the flywheel was powering. And that finally got rid of some of the kind of disruptions in the current that were playing havoc with it. Um, and the suspended ceiling. Now, this is absolutely, I mean, suspended ceiling is everywhere now. But it was kind of a real higher novelty in those days. Um, and so was kind of a raised floor to hide the cables. So later data rooms always had air conditioning, suspended ceiling, raised floor, so they would look good. Because in those days, a company bought a computer. They were going to have people coming around admiring it all day. Um, it was kind of part of the tour for every visitor to the installation. And ENIAC was the same way. They were always having people coming through. So the army wanted it to look good. And they were kind of agonizing for a while over whether to spring for the suspended ceiling or not. They only installed it, approved it in the end in 1947 when they realized how many visitors they were going to have. Um, even before it was finished during the war, right, when it was secret, and people say ENIAC was a secret project, but there were different grades of secret, and it wasn't that secret. It wasn't you know, the Manhattan Project. It was kind of an open secret among people who were working on other wartime projects. So, and Goldstein was kind of keen to spread the word as far as he could. So before it was even finished, um, the Pentagon wrote to the Moore School saying, hey, you guys are so late. Stop showing people around. <laughs> you, know, you should be working on the thing. Uh, but. Uh, see, there's uh, Truman visiting in 1948, one of the most distinguished visitors. So that continued into the Moore School days. But in December 47, right, which is almost a year after the thing has been transported and set up at BRL, New York Times runs a report. Uh, unfortunately, it's only doing two hours of production work a week. So in that kind of conventional date, right, 43 to 46 that we saw earlier for ENIAC, Remember, by the end of 47, it's still only getting two hours a week uh, of work done every week. So that's why I think this kind of practice-focused approach to history gives you a kind of completely different sense of you know, how the machine is developing. Um, most of the time is being spent trying to diagnose and fix the hardware. So we have a section in the book where we, we found the logbook for the machine, which kind of tells you, um, it's like the diary every day for a couple of years at BRL, they'd write what it was doing that day. And it gives you this great sense for how it's actually working. So we could reconstruct. Uh, so there was a guy called Frank Grubbs. He was a PhD student turned mathematician for BRL. He had to interrupt his PhD studies at the University of Michigan for the war, came in, actually did very well. Um, he got interested in uh, statistical tests for uh, uh, outliers and so on, because you know they had just such vast quantities of munitions around the world in different places they needed to try and keep track of. Um, they had these giant kind of statistical problems. So he was working on statistical tests for outliers, and he managed to get a month of ENIAC time for the work that became his PhD thesis, which probably no graduate student since has ever come close to matching. It was the only operational, programmable digital computer at the time. Um, so that sounds great. Unfortunately, the first three weeks, they got not a single piece of usable output produced. And it's kind of agonizing to read it. We've, we've got this sort of blow-by-blow blow summary in the book of how it went. Um, there were intermittents. The power supplies dumped. When they finally got some results out, they found that they'd made an error in the mathematical treatment, so the results were useless. Um, it was, uh, then they kept having to stop work because people were coming in to upgrade the hardware. Uh, 
They finally got some results out that looked good, but then they did what was standard procedure, which was run it again. Then they compared the car output cards. They were different. Um, one day, and that's this one, you can kind of hear the bitterness coming through in the logbook entry. So they spent the whole morning getting ready for a visit from the Secretary of the Army instead of doing anything useful. And then they heard just before lunch that he'd changed his mind and wasn't coming. Um, so one of the heroes that you probably won't have heard about is this guy, uh, Homer Spence. So he would, he'd got experience with radar. He was an enlisted man assigned uh, during the war to help ENIAC at the Moore School. He liked the job so much he came back as a civilian to BRL and basically was the head maintenance engineer through the whole period of the machine's life. And they said that by, according to testimony in a lawsuit later, that he basically had resoldered every single joint on the machine. That's about half a million by the end of his time there. And as a result, it was running a whole lot better. Uh, and that's obviously just one of many things. Right? You've just got a lot of like tacit knowledge. The operators kind of learn the little tricks. They get better at using the thing. But look, here's the usable time, right? 25% or so in second quarter of 48. And it's peaking here at about 70% usable production time. So, you know, you don't think of necessarily that kind of rewiring and reliability improves what the operators do as part of innovation. But that turns it from this hugely expensive flop into this extremely useful, reliable piece of machinery. And I think that's certainly something we should think of as part of the work of innovation. Now, the book is called Making and Remaking ENIAC. And another thing we talk about is that you lose with just thinking, hey, ENIAC, 1945, is how much the machine changed over its lifespan. So one thing that people don't talk about so much, it seems that the, uh, in 1947, now remember, I talked about the operators, and they did a whole bunch of different things. But we think of as a programmer, as somebody you know, who isn't hands-on working the machine, who's kind of just sitting there all day writing code. Um, back in the 60s and the 70s, they thought of a programmer as a guy with a pencil who's writing you know, on a piece of paper even, because they didn't have video terminals mostly. Um, and the first person to basically, the first people to basically fill that role, that they're responsible for writing programs, but not running a center or operating a machine, is 1947 under Jean Bartik, one of the original operators. She didn't go to be an operator at BRL, but she was hired uh, as a subcontractor to run a group at the University of Pennsylvania to help develop programs for ENIAC. So those seem to be the first time that anyone's hired specifically to do programming. Uh, now, as you may know, core memory was the standard memory technology from the mid-50s through to the, well, on larger machines at least, uh, some way into the 70s. And that there, looking unexpectedly like a kind of negative image from 2001 monolith, is, um, one of the first production core memories ever fitted to a computer built by Burroughs. Um, they tried to have a delay line memory in 47, but it never worked. So the only time they got a chance to upgrade the memory was in 53, when Burroughs delivered uh, a core memory. And that gave them much more space to hold things. Now, the most important innovation, and we write about this a lot in the book, is the new programming system. Right? So remember I told you how ENIAC was conventionally basically configured, I don't even necessarily want to say programmed, by wiring together a special purpose computer from this kind of construction kit. Now, in 1948, all that changed. So the first draft on the report of the EDVAC lays out the architectural ideas of modern computing. Um, it gives a description, basically, of assembly language programming, which if you've worked with these you know, machines from the 70s um, and early 80s, is recognizably the same thing. So that's kind of a huge step forward. You can argue about where the ideas in the report came from, but I don't want to get into that right now. Um, and people set out, read that report, and were like, hey, this is amazing. And that's what inspired people around the world to start building computers. But it took a while to build one. So they, what they realized was, wait, we can kind of wire ENIAC to do all kinds of things. Why don't we wire it to act like one of those newfangled computers that has an instruction set and stores its programs in an addressable memory. And they did. So after 1948, most of those control switches and wires never moved. 
And here is a extract from what we found in the Library of Congress in the John von Neumann papers. The code for this program, which is a Monte Carlo simulation of what happens when an atomic bomb explodes. Uh, this was done for Los Alamos. They wanted to test new designs. People talk a lot about ENIAC doing uh, hydrogen bomb calculations, but it was actually for uh, fission weapons, not for fusion weapons. Um, and, you know, fortunately, uh, I don't think they really knew what it was, so the code's not classified or anything. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we've got the whole thing online, annotated and so on. You can go and read it on our website, eniacinaction.com. And we say, in a sense, this is the first modern computer program ever run. It's not the first one to be written. This, but this was run on ENIAC before the Manchester Baby and um, EDSAC um, in Cambridge and the other kind of machines that were designed from scratch to run this kind of code. We're not saying that the computer had all the features of those machines, but we're saying if what you think of is important about what's often called the stored program concept is the program, this is exactly like that, and it was run on ENIAC before those other machines were in action. And I'm kind of a little bit feeling dirty now because I'm talking about firsts, but uh, <laughs> I thought it might still be worth mentioning. All right, so see, that's what the programming process looked like before. The closest thing that ENIAC had to kind of a written down version of a program as opposed to just a chart on which they mark the positions of all the wires was this, which is showing you um, step by step through the operation of the program going down what each of the things is doing. And the full thing would like fill this entire wall. Like <laughs> those, it was enormous. And um, this is a, something that's derived from that, which is a chart showing how each piece of the machine should be set up and how the wires should be run from different buses to different controls. Right? So that is nothing like what you think of as being a computer program. Now, they had to figure out a setup of ENIAC that would be in that form, but would let it basically interpret modern computer architecture so that they could run code that's recognizably code. And this was the first version of that in the summer of 1947 by Adele Goldstein, Herman Goldstein's uh, wife, it's in her handwriting at least, although it was a team effort to develop it. And it's describing an instruction set. So you've got a two-digit code for multiplier, two-digit code for subtract, divide, etc. right, recognizably an instruction set. Uh, that went through a bunch of different, of the same kind described in the first draft, um, 1945, where we understand that concept to have come from. Uh, they went through a whole load of work to figure out the optimum way of configuring ENIAC to run code like this. This is a setup from uh, the kind of metal binder that was used to actually hold the master configuration and kept with ENIAC. Um, and that gave them the ability to run much more complicated programs because the constraint on how complicated the program was was basically how many all right, where's my picture of them? I guess it's further forwards. How many numbers they had on these panels, right? It took, most instructions, it took two of these decimal digits to code. So you turn the knob to represent a particular decimal digit. And that gave them the capability to run programs that were thousands of instructions long. And that in turn gave them, this is an extremely complicated flow diagram, right? I mean, if you come across flowcharts, it's in this kind of debased 1960s version that they just have in introductory program books. And you know, if you actually use one, you just reverse engineer it from the code after you've written it. Yeah. <laughs> um, but the technique started out as a very actually mathematically, logically nuanced notation. And you can see inside these individual boxes, you can't even see, but there's a bunch of integrals, a bunch of things complicated, very complicated things in each one of these. So this is what the poster is about. Um, I meant to bring some and I forgot, but if you want one, you can email me, they're free. Um, and we found that in the Library of Congress. We were like, wow, that is like an amazingly complicated computer program by the standards of the 40s. And to think that they were able to fit it on ENIAC thanks to this ingenious system that holds the programs on those switches is, is fairly incredible. Um, it's got something over 800 instructions in it. Yeah. Uh, this is the kind of code listing that we found. Uh, so after that point, configuring ENIAC for a new job just meant turning these switches to set up new code. 
Now, I just want to cycle back to kind of that beginning very quickly. Like, how does this change how we should think about, you know, the big picture history of computing innovation, those topics I had at the beginning? Well, as the computer enters business, right, there's some managers inside a vacuum tube. This is the first glossy advert for a business computer ever made, as far as I know. Uh, the fact troller. They didn't, they hadn't come up with information technology then. Um, there's this massive, massive rush to install computers, thousands and thousands of them, even before there's any clear economic benefits. And, but the point is, this kind of, it's not that operations work goes away, right? We might think of the history of computing as being a history of programming and innovation and genius, but if you look at the data processing, those are the people who are using computers in big companies, breakdown, 1971, right? The category is, okay, 17% of people are programmers, You've got analysts writing the specs, managers overseeing it. But look, a quarter are operations, and 31% are the women doing the key punching of the data onto the cards. So that kind of work that was pioneered by the ENIAC women on the hands-on side doesn't go away. It becomes a kind of work that is predominantly done by women in companies later in the history of computing. So, you know, you probably have heard of... Um, Ada Lovelace and Grace Hopper and, and those people. And there's really this process where people look around, right? I mean, I look around this room here, for example, would be a case and I say, yeah, there's a certain kind of gender imbalance, right? <laughs> and that's true across most areas of computing. So people say, oh my God, that's terrible. How do we fix it? I know, like girls, when they grow up and read about famous computing pioneers, they're not reading about people like them. So let's celebrate some women. So that kind of idea of showing, yeah, right at the beginning, Ada Lovelace invented programming, she was a woman, you're a woman, you can do it too, right? And absolutely, I mean, it's a problem and we need to do something with it. Um, and in that kind of vein, the women of ENIAC, those first operators, are increasingly being added to Ada Lovelace and Grace Hopper to make this kind of like trinity um, and remembered as the first programmers. So they were kind of, and they used to be very forgotten no question about that. Uh, w. Bugley Fitz, who worked on ENIAC himself, um, did oral histories with them, collected materials, published a great article in Annals in 1996. A woman called Kathy Kleeman worked for years to make a movie about them, bring them more attention. There was a 1996 Wall Street Journal column. Jennifer S. Light on the academic side wrote a great 1999 paper, When Computers Were Women. So they kind of became well known over the 1990s. But a concern I have is that this idea of the women of ENIAC is now very applied very narrowly just to those six operators hired in 1945 who worked in 1946. Right? And they've got their names on this monument now at the University of Pennsylvania. And we don't think about those 50 plus women who actually built ENIAC as being the women of ENIAC, or Adele Goldstein who wrote the manual and trained and recruited the other women, or Clara von Neumann who, remember that listing we saw? Right? That's her handwriting. She's the woman who coded the first modern computer program ever run on any computer. Or of the many later operators and programmers, some of them male, some of them female, who worked on ENIAC at BRL. Now, Walter Isaacson has somehow, right, I mean, this is 2014, and we've got the forgotten female programmers who created modern tech. That was an NPR thing when he was promoting his book. Um, and in his book, he says, all the engineers who built ENIAC's hardware were men, right? Now, one thing that tells me is Walter Isaacson doesn't understand what engineers do because he thinks they, they build everything personally. Um, but we also know it's literally wrong. The people who built ENIAC's hardware actually were women. And then he says, all the programmers who created the first general purpose computer were women. Well, programmers don't create computers. Um, and calling them programmers, you know, is also kind of hiding that whole operations side of the work. So I think in our kind of eagerness to set up role models, there's a lot of kind of historical, actual content and things that could let us tell more interesting stories being forgot. So we now have this weird situation that, right, so 2014, Walter Isaacson is claiming he's rescuing these forgotten women, the six operators. But Jean Bartik had already had a New York Times obituary. There was a movie about them. She has a museum and a computer fellow, fellow from the Computer History Museum. So we're in a strange situation now where people are famous for being forgotten, but we act like they're still forgotten. 
if you Google the first programmers, you get Ada Lovelace and the ENIAC women. At least I did when I did this, right? But, you know, we're, nobody is interested in, like, celebrating and remembering the first computer operators. And I think that's actually a problem. Um, so you can think of it as girls who code, right? That's this kind of movement versus women who operate. Um, and my argument would be, we kind of basically can't fix the problems with the great men version of history that just a few kind of brilliant guys do everything by adding a few great women to you know, balance it out. But the problem is basically this insistence on genius and innovative breakthroughs isn't compatible with the kind of work that historically women have generally actually been doing, like operating the machine. And by the 50s, computer operations and key punch work in the data processing departments were, right, were seen as kind of blue collar work. It would be maybe paid on an hourly basis, you know, shift workers, right, and disproportionately those jobs would be done by women. So I don't think it's some kind of great piece of feminist brilliance to pretend that the operators were really programmers and only remember them that way, or to pretend that Ada Lovelace, you know, was a genius who single-handedly, blah, 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 you know, because it's buying into these narratives that systematically devalue and hide the kind of work that women actually usually got to do in the real past. Uh, this has also been noted by Wendy Hui Kang Choi, who wrote, reclaiming these women as the first programmers glosses over the hierarchies among operators, coders, and analysts. Um, this is a particularly dramatic thing, right? How they've been misremembered. So Walter Isaacson came to Penn to open some big shiny new building, and the report, official report on the Penn website says, six women PhD students yeah, were tasked with programming the machine Right. They, they weren't students. They certainly weren't PhD students. They were, you know, working, doing calculations. Um, you could also tie this in, in, kind of in conclusion, this, like, hiding of certain kinds of work, you know, with cloud computing now, right? We want to pretend that, like, computing doesn't have any materiality to it, doesn't have any labor. It's all just some magic thing that floats on a cloud somewhere. Um, and that hides from view the actual physical infrastructure and challenges of computing. Just as this kind of focus on genius conceptual breakthroughs and programming has hidden, from, uh, has hidden the historical reality of early computing from view. Right, so we associate innovation very much with science, progress, Silicon Valley, billionaires. Um, and, and that's a problem for people like me who do the history of computing because history, you know, you can't really get away from it. It's about the past. Um, just earlier this year, Vinod Kolsa, the famous Silicon Valley venture capitalist and innovator, wrote, if subjects like history and literature are focused on too early, it's easy for someone not to learn to think for themselves and not to question assumptions, conclusions, and expert philosophies. This can do a lot of damage. As he's saying, basically, people shouldn't be exposed to history because it might you know, corrupt their thinking. Um, there's an ironic proposal to do this by my friend Andy Russell that's actually taken off and become something with a real life of its own. His answer to Isaacson, which I very much agree with, is the maintainers, how a group of bureaucrats, standard engineers, and introverts made digital infrastructures that kind of work most of the time. His, <laughs> his focus is on internet history, which is another chapter in Isaacson's book. Um, so my closing thoughts, right? History matters, you know, despite what Colsa thinks despite the fact that everything in IT is always focused on the future and the next new thing, and it's going to make everything that ever happened in the history of mankind irrelevant, right? But it doesn't. It really doesn't. History does matter. There's a lot more to history than firsts and lone geniuses, right? Don't believe the imitation game. Successful IT innovation is always dependent on execution, operations, logistics, doing the little things well, as well as the big things. So how would I summarize the work of innovation based on the actual history of ENIAC? I'd say ENIAC's the story of smart to very smart, hardworking to obsessive, flawed men and women who came together to do many kinds of work more or less collaboratively. Now, they finished up suing each other and arguing about things for decades, so we talk about that later in the book. But it's certainly a remarkable <laughs> accomplishment for cooperation. Um, they were also lucky, right? I mean, they were in the right places at the right times. They were supported by bigger institutions like the US Army and the University of Pennsylvania so that they could get the work that they needed to do done. Uh, they did their jobs, I would say, well enough in challenging times. They don't, you know, they don't need to be superhuman. Uh, so they changed the world even without superpowers. I'd say that's something they all did together, even the secretary and the drafts women, 
and those wire women whose names I've forgotten. Thanks. All right.